All right, good evening and welcome to the Vancouver Aquarium's first lecture of 2015. Happy to have you here tonight. Our program tonight is Whales, Turtles, and More, uh, Understanding and Protecting Our Ocean Heritage Through the Intersection of Science, Outreach, and Education. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Sean Brilliant, this is the manager of marine programs at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. The Canadian Wildlife Federation was started in 1962 with the mission to conserve and inspire the conservation of Canada's wildlife and habitats for the use and enjoyment of all. A value that we hold in high regard here at the Vancouver Aquarium. They were recently recognized as one of Canada's top 25 charities. They have a wide range of programs aimed at getting Canadians out into nature. Geocaching, hinterland who's who, backyard habitat certification, rowing for research, backing the leatherbacks, just to name a few. So without any further ado, Dr. Sean Brilliant, thank, thank you very much. You. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much for that introduction. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk here tonight at the Vancouver Aquarium. What an exciting thing. Thank you all very much for coming out, uh, braving this winter you have here in Vancouver, if that's what it's called. But I know it's tough for you. I saw someone wearing uh, gloves today. I couldn't believe it. So, <clears throat> um, so I'm, uh, uh, I'm based in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We, we also have fairly mild winters, not this mild, but um, uh, nothing to complain about really. And so it's, a, it's really a, a great opportunity for me to be here and talk to you about some of the projects that we have on the go today. Um, I have lots of stuff I want to talk to you about, so I'm just going to get right into it today. The first thing I'm going to do is turn on my clicker, which is now on. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, Canadian Wildlife Federation. Um, I we just had a great introduction to it, but just very quickly, um, it, we did turn 50 back in 2012. We just got recognized by the Financial Post as one of Canada's top 25 charities. We are a nonprofit charitable organization. Our mission is to conserve and to inspire Canadians to conserve wildlife and wild habitat specifically. Um, and I want you to keep this in mind. I think you'll see evidence of this throughout. The other thing that's really uh, important here is our motto. Our motto is your connection to wildlife. This is something that we take seriously and, and really sort of builds into sort of how we do things as well. We're a fairly large organization. We have about 300,000 supporters across the country and we deal with a wide variety of issues and, and, and projects. Many of which you'll, you'll know. We have magazines. Our Canadian Wildlife is, the, is our main magazine and our children's um, or, or a youth magazine is called Canadian, uh, pardon me, it's called Wild. We produce a wide variety of educational materials, Wild About program and the Wild About posters. You can go online and order these for free online. Wild About snakes and bats and turtles, pollinators, birds, wildflowers, small mammals, I'm sure I'm forgetting more. There's a whole bunch on there. The other thing that we're sort of well known for is our hinterland who's who. Um, we've been producing this for a while in case you're not sure what this is. Does anybody know what that is? In really? Canada, wildlife is always close by. You all look kind of young to know what that is. But anyway, we've been, we've been producing Canadian Wildlife, uh, uh, Canadian Wildlife Federation in cooperation with Canadian Wildlife Service, producing these hinterland who's who public service announcements um, since 2000. They, they were produced uh, decades ago, of course, by Canadian Wildlife Service, and we've been producing new ones ever since 2000, releasing two or three a year ever since, and more are coming out later this year as well. Um, a wide variety of projects that we run, Walk for Wildlife, we have a Love Your Lake program for cottage owners who want to manage their shorelines better. Uh, we do a lot of work on bats and the white nose disease that's sort of wiping them out on the east and, and sort of moving this way. Our photo, monthly photo club and our annual photo contest goes on every year as well, which are very popular too. We have two big projects coming up that I just want to draw your attention to. One is a wild migrations map. Um, this is a large map that we had produced by us, uh, produced for us by uh, Canadian Geographic. This is like a, a 10 meter by 10 meter map of Canada that shows endangered species migrating across North America and South America so that, so that it can go to schools and children can have a chance to sort of see and learn and experience firsthand what migrations are going on across Canada. It's going to go across the country. It's moving east initially and I think it's supposed to be in BC. Um, I think it's going to be like uh, end, of, uh, end of the school year in 2016, so uh, a year's time or so it should be coming this way. And now that I've said it live, I hope I'm not overcommitting ourselves to something that I don't know. Anyway, very exciting. Another project sale for 
wildlife program. I want to mention this because this is linked, of course, to our Wild About Sports program. Um, this is a, a project that's uh, looked after by Damien Foxhall. Damien's a, a racer. He works with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And currently he's at, I think he's at the Vancouver Boat Show um, for the rest of the week. And, and he may show up here tonight as well. And uh, this is all about trying to engage recreational boaters in particular and getting them to recognize that what they're skating across as they're flying across the ocean is not just simply asphalt or pavement, but rather there's habitat and wildlife there as well. It's also an opportunity for incorporating conservation messaging into sort of non-traditional areas, and, and that's something else that I'm going to talk on uh, in a few minutes. Um, okay, enough of, <clears throat> enough of that. Let's talk about what I'm going to talk about tonight. There are three things I'm going to talk to you about tonight, and you can keep score if you want. The first thing I want to talk about is how we sometimes forget about wildlife. The second thing I'm going to talk about is how we go about doing conservation and what conservation is. It's too easy to throw these words around, wildlife and conservation, what do these mean? There is meanings and there's important meanings to these things. And the third thing is, is your direct role in conservation. You, like specifically, individually, we have roles in conservation. You may not realize it, but there are roles to take in. So these are the three things we're going to talk about tonight. Let's get into the first, wildlife. I think I have like probably 40 minutes of things to say and 30 minutes to say it, so pay attention, it's gonna go real fast. Let's talk about wildlife. What is wildlife? It seems pretty easy to talk about what wildlife is. Lots of ideas come to mind. Large, majestic animals, sometimes beautiful and strange animals, birds and moose, bear, cougar, lynx. These are the things we tend to think of. And of course, we're correct, I guess. These are wildlife. Nobody would, would contradict or, or challenge any of this. Canada's marine wildlife, the situation's the same. We have a variety of amazing species that live in our three oceans around us. We have a lot of ocean in Canada and a lot of wildlife that lives in it. Certainly the whales that live in our oceans and around us are something that most people would consider wildlife, as well as the turtles. These are something, everybody loves turtles, loggerheads and leatherbacks, once in a while a green, as we found out. Usually no argument there. Lots of other types of marine mammals as well live in our waters, and most people would say, are these wildlife? Yes, this makes sense. These are the sea lions and seals that live in our coasts and waters. Lots of wild birds and, and seabirds that live on our shores and on our water that we're aware of, and when you see them, of course, you tend to think these are wildlife. This is what I'm actually thinking about. Lots of big fish that live in our waters as well. We don't always get to see these either, but usually if we say, are these wildlife? Is this something you'd consider wildlife? Most people are gonna agree, right? I don't think anyone's gonna challenge that idea. I realize I'm mostly talking to the enlightened here. What about cute little guys like this? Is this wildlife? Crabs that live among the seagrass? What about the seagrass itself or the seaweeds that grow on the rocks, if we give any second thought to these? <clears throat> what about the strange but beautiful creatures that live on the rocks and under the rocks or in the rocks? What about things that look like this that most people are like, I don't even know if that's a plant or an animal or what it is. Is it wildlife? I know I'm talking to mostly an enlightened crew here and most people are going to, at a second, maybe a second thought you go, yeah, of course this is wildlife, right? But now you're starting to think about it a little, right? What about the forage fish? Sometimes they used to be called trash fish. That's what they would call them. Now they're called forage fish. Sardines, anchovies, gasparo, uh, alewife. These are small fish in the ocean that we don't tend to eat. Sometimes we do. Mostly we don't tend to eat. We do tend to fish them, though. We tend to feed them to our animals and make feed for aquaculture and so on. But we don't tend to eat them too much. Do we consider these wildlife or are these the food that wildlife eats? We've got to think of these things. I realize it takes a minute and you think, yeah, probably so. But what if we go smaller? What about the bugs that actually drive everything that's in the ocean? This is a copepod, a little zooplankton, like half the size of a grain of rice or smaller. And these things are extremely important. Are they wildlife, though, or are they just food for wildlife? These things determine the distribution of so many animals in our oceans, it's, it's hard to imagine what, you know, what it would look like if, if, they weren't, uh, if, if they had a different distribution or if they had different um, features affecting them and so on. So we have to keep these things in mind. Wildlife has a lot of broad definitions, and again, I know you sort of think and go, okay, yeah, that's right, I guess these are wildlife, we need to keep these things in mind, but even we need to be careful, and, and those of you that think about what wildlife are and recognize how ocean systems work, need to remind yourself once in a while that these are things that deserve respect as wildlife as well. Let's take it in a slightly different direction now. Cod, lobster, snow crab, salmon, when I said lobster, did anybody go, hmm, I haven't had lobster in a while, right? Are these Canada's marine wildlife or are these Canada's natural resources? 
are these wildlife or is this food that's swimming in the ocean that needs to be on my plate? A lot of the time, I, I work in lobster a lot. I, I grew up around lobster fishermen and lobster fishing. And <clears throat> you know, you mention lobster to people, and most people's reaction is, "I love lobster," or "Oh, I hate lobster." Anybody here dislike lobster? Oh, a couple people. There's always a few. But anyway, most people like lobster and they want to eat it. Anyway, but this is a danger, a little bit of a danger, and we need to be mindful of this. That it's okay to like eating these things. I'm not going to judge that or, or say anything different about that. But let's not forget that they're also wildlife. They have a, a role in the, the ecosystem. They are a, 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 an organism unto itself. They reproduce and grow. They interact with a wide variety of animals. They are wildlife as well, despite the fact that we like to harvest them and eat them as, as much as possible. Sometimes, depending on the industry you're in, you might see these as money instead of food, right? This, you're, if, you're, if you're a harvester of these things, you might be looking to harvest them. And it's fine, these are all these things. They are food, they are money, they are also wildlife. And we should keep in mind that they are first wildlife as well. So this is something that, that, that I always like to bring up just to give everybody a quick introspection so you can kind of think about these things. Let's not forget what wildlife is. It's a very broad general definition and we need to always keep this in mind. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is how do you do conservation? Especially how do you do conservation in the ocean? Kind of tough, but let me show you. This is the ocean. If you're lucky, there might be a buoy or something floating there, but it's pretty flat. There's not a whole lot going on there, right? How do you do conservation in an area like this? And it's very alien to us as well. Here's one of my favorite web comics, XKCD, Randall Monroe's work. I don't know if you've seen this. So there's a little uh, uh, stick figure cue ball up, stranded on a desert island with the palm trees, writing in his book, day 44, still stranded with nothing but flat, empty water as far as the eye can see. Ah, how crazy is that, right? But then the rest of the comic looks like this. I could almost just put this up. I almost don't even need to give a presentation after I show something like this. The truth behind what this is showing is just wonderful. There is so much going on. It's an alien world to us. You know, not only can we not really live there without a lot of specialized equipment, we can't even perceive it. And there's all kinds of stuff that's going on in the ocean. And how many people have this perspective as cue ball up here? Whether you're living on a coastal city like Halifax or Vancouver, or you're on a sailboat, or, or anything else. It's so hard to see anything else but that flat surface. But there is a lot going on there. And we need to make sure that we conserve it, that we protect it for the use and enjoyment of all. How do we go about doing that? I'm going to talk about two beasts in particular, just to give you some background. Uh, North Atlantic right whales and leatherback turtles. These are two species that we've done a fair amount of work on, and I'm going to use them as sort of examples tonight to talk about how we go about doing conservation, marine conservation in, in this context. North Atlantic right whales, well, let me see here. So uh, this is the east coast of uh, North America, from Florida all the way up to Canada. This is the Bay of Fundy, Halifax is there, the island of Newfoundland is up here, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and PEI is right here. Mm -hmm. So first, let's talk about right whales. Right whales are, um, North Atlantic right whales, pardon me, are um, relatively one of the most rarest whales in the world. The North Pacific right whale, I think, is actually more rare. I think unicorns are more abundant than North Pacific right whales. Although you have seen a few in the last couple of years, which is really crazy and kind of exciting. But um, they're extremely rare. North Atlantic right whales, also very rare. The reason they're rare is because they're really fat. These things are only about 13 to 15 meters or, or so, 16 meters in length, so they're not as, as big as a blue whale, but they can weigh up to 70 or 80 tons. They're extremely round and fat animals and made them really good targets for hunting. Pre-industrial whaling pretty much put these into extinction and they haven't really recovered yet. They swim along the coast of North America in particular. Um, they tend to give birth down here off Florida, Georgia coast uh, near the shore. They swim up the coast into the spring um, in the southern Gulf of Maine and then in the summer and fall in the Bay of Fundy and off the coast of Nova Scotia before they head back down here to uh, Florida and Georgia. Um, mostly that's what they do most of the time, but in some years they actually go elsewhere. And in the last couple of years they haven't actually been going to where they usually go and we don't know where they go. We think they go up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. They're occasionally seen off the coast of Gaspé. We have seen North Atlantic right whales show up over in Iceland on, on the other side of the Atlantic, really. So, but we don't actually know where they are yet. This is a little disconcerting. How do you look after an animal that you don't even know where it's going? What makes this even more difficult is that, as I mentioned, the females come down here to give birth. But where do the males go? We're not exactly sure. And where do the non-females go? Presumably, they all go to a singles bar, if you know what I mean. 
but we're not exactly sure where that singles bar is, and we're still sort of um, figuring that out. We're, we've found some evidence in recent years, so uh, things are improving. Our understanding is starting to improve. So that's North Atlantic right whales. We'll talk about leatherback turtles now. These, largest reptile in the world, heaviest reptile in the world anyway, um, swim up the middle or uh, middle of the Western Atlantic anyway until they run into the coast of Nova Scotia. They follow the coast of Nova Scotia roughly up and then take a left into the Gulf of St. Lawrence where they spend the rest of the summer feeding, gorging themselves on jellyfish. They put on hundreds of kilograms each animal eating just jellyfish. If you want to put on weight, a bulk system, you might want to think about lion's mane jellyfish. Apparently it works. So after they've been feeding all summer and putting on a tremendous amount of weight, then they bolt out of there very quickly and head back out into the middle of the ocean. If they're looking to hang out for the winter, the females go down into the Caribbean area, roughly in South America, to the nesting beaches where they, where they lay eggs. There is also unknowns here as well. We, we, we know leatherbacks occasionally show up into the Bay of Fundy, but we don't see a whole lot of them. And we know that they do. there is a nesting beach down here in Florida, but most of the, our Canadian, Atlantic Canadian leatherbacks actually apparently are down in the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago especially, but uh, some of those other countries. And we haven't seen too many here in Flor uh, from Florida and none from Africa as well. So there's a few unknowns to this beast too and where, where it is and what it does, uh, even when it's in Canadian waters. So this is, these are two beasts that come up into our area every year to feed. I didn't mention, but uh, right whales like to come up and they feed in deep basins um, around the Gramanan Basin and Roseway Basin in particular, really deep basins that fill up with copepods. They eat these little copepods, you know, tiny little things and put on hundreds of kilograms feeding on these things. This is also a very popular area for many other species. Fin whales, humpback whales, blue whales come up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence as well. Many fish as well. And when there's lots of fish, it means there's also lots of fishing. That's the problem. This is fishing for just the maritime provinces from 1998 to 2003. Red means a lot. Green means not so much. We have a data set that's larger than this now, and it includes Newfoundland and Quebec, but this is just an older graphic to give you an idea of the intensity of fishing that takes place around the maritime provinces. And when there's this amount of fishing, which is traps and rope and everything else in the water, there is lots of entanglement that takes place. So animals blunder into these things. Bycatch is another word for it, although it's a bit of a misnomer because when you're fishing for lobster, you don't mean to catch whale by mistake. You just have a whale run into your gear. And so it's more of an entanglement. The same is true of leatherback turtles when these things run into them. We've had a number of these this past year in, in PEI in particular, off the coast of PEI. So how do we deal with this entanglement issue? These species, these entanglements can become quite horrific. Ropes can stay on these animals for years. Sometimes they can free themselves, but sometimes it cuts into them and slowly kills them. They are no longer able to feed. They become uh, infected and die, uh, or at least they're not able to reproduce or feed properly and they waste away, and it's, it's a horrific thing. It has serious conservation issues because these things, oh, pardon me, because these things don't always um, take care of themselves. How do we deal with this? So how do we do conservation in the ocean, as I said? Well, the first thing is we need knowledge. This is where science comes in. And so we're involved in this. <clears throat> as I said, using right whales in particular, we have these question marks and we don't have a good understanding about where the whales go. So what we did is we came up with a model that sort of explains how this is done. This is a project that we've done uh, is a partnership with Dalhousie University and WWF Canada. We came up with a model that helps predict where right whales are as they move from month to month, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March. So now we can, we have a model that lets us predict where leatherback turtles are, or pardon me, where right whales are. We are also doing this for leatherback turtles. And this is a project that we're doing in partnership with the Canadian Sea Turtle Network and tag leatherback turtles. And we get an idea in July and August, September, October, and November where leatherback turtles are as well. And this is a predictive model that lets us predict where they are. Once we combine this with the fisheries data that I showed you earlier, a bit more complicated than this, but a bit of the fisheries data, then we can start making predictions about where entanglement might actually occur. So we can say, okay, well, for crab gear in August with leatherback turtles, this seems like an area that looks like there's a lot of possible entanglement. Maybe this is something that we need to look at, so we'll talk about it in a minute. But now we're in the process of creating knowledge. Fortunately, our model on right whales just has recently been published, I think, and we're in the process of preparing this other research for publication as well. So it's actually um, getting reviewed and hopefully will end up being used as well. 
The next thing we need to do, how do you do conservation in the ocean? We need to inspire Canadians to conserve wildlife. Do you remember what I said from the beginning? CWF has sort of a dual mission. One is to actually do conservation, and another is to inspire Canadians to do conservation. How do we do that? We need to make a connection between people and the wildlife and wild habitats. How do you make a connection between you living on the, the west coast of the country with North Atlantic right whales, an 80-ton animal that swims up and down the east coast of North America, uh, hundreds of kilometers offshore, in very cold water. If you're lucky, you'll get to see one, but how do you make that connection? It's very difficult. I like this picture. This is a picture from NOAA. A research vessel uh, was out tagging leatherback turtles, and this was just a picture as a part of their website or blog. And I borrowed it. Don't worry, I'm going to put it back afterwards. Um, this is uh, uh, the captain of the vessel, I guess, and uh, I like this picture because I looked at it and thought, this guy is having a great connection to this leatherback turtle. Like, look at them chilling out. I'm sure the turtle's distressed. I shouldn't say I'm sure. I'm not sure leatherback turtles get distressed about anything. They're pretty tough and they're pretty... Anyway, this guy's having a good time anyway. And what a connection, what a wonderful opportunity to just sit with this magnificent looking animal. Look at how beautiful this thing is. And captured without hurting it, and they've tagged it, and now they're going to put it back in. An amazing connection. This is the type of thing that we need to do. Canadians need to have an opportunity to connect to their wildlife, even those animals that are so foreign and alien and come from a different world, even more important that we do. One way that we do this is we had a project called the Great Canadian Turtle Race. We ran it back in 2012 during our 50th anniversary. I think we promoted it a bit here at the Vancouver Aquarium. You sort of helped us promote it, which was uh, really appreciated and really great. What we did is um, we partnered with the Canadian Sea Turtle Network, and, um, and we got them to tag turtles for us. So this is Dr. Mike James out in the bowsprit of this boat uh, carrying a big butterfly net, and they would uh, get a hold of a leatherback and bring them in and do all kinds of measurements and tag them and put them back in the water. And then these satellite tags allowed us to track them. We had 10 of these turtles, and we made it into a race. And we wanted people to follow this race and see what these turtles were going to do. And we had a contest for names, so we gave them all names based on the contest. And then we tracked them on this live map, so you could go on every day and see how your turtle was doing. And we wanted you to find a turtle that you wanted to follow and pay attention to it and track it. So we we looked at all the turtles, we gave them all names, we gave them background information as well, and then we even created a little program here that I'm going to show you to try and, and demonstrate even better how amazing these animals are. So we created these 3D animated models so that you could actually take a closer look at your turtle and see what they're really like. And then you could flip through the different turtles because of course not every turtle is the same. So if you happen to like this lady with the, the scar on her back, or you, you like this one with all the barnacles on her back, or you could flip through them and decide which one. I should know their names, I know, but I don't remember their names now, I'm afraid. Is that coming through? Is that a little, little dark there? Maybe I can bring her up into the light a little bit, right? <clears throat> anyway, so you know, we need to try and find these novel opportunities to make people just like that captain sitting beside there and experiencing that leatherback turtle. Here is an albeit... Uh, far less <laughs> uh, exciting opportunity, but an opportunity for them to see and realize what magnificent beasts they are. This one seems to have a little scar on her side. And anyway, so it's a lot of fun to be able to flip through them and, and see what's going on, and we tried to make this available for people to really make a connection to their, to their turtles and decide which one they're going to root for. We provided blogs. We provided lots of information about what the issues are. We didn't restrict it just to leatherback turtles. We talked about all kinds of other marine conservation issues out there. People just need to have a connection to these animals, to all of the animals, to want to see them conserved, to, to be inspired for their conservation. And this is what we wanted to provide. Incidentally, in case you're wondering, this is how it looked at the end. I don't know if you can see it, but the red dots indicate where they were tagged. And they all went up here and gorged themselves for the summer. And then they came out. And the yellow stars indicate the last point where we had them. Eventually, the tags fail because they get fouled or they fall off or, or something else. And our winner was down here in Colombia, a little rural beach off of rural Colombia, way out of nowhere, sort of where we didn't expect her to land. We think we had two that nested, but, but we're not sure about this one because the, the tag gave out just before she came ashore. What's really cool about this is this turtle nested. The Canadian Sea Turtle Network, our partners in this project, had contacts down in Columbia, and they were like, hey, we had this turtle nest. Can you go out and do it? They usually have patrols, and can you find these? You know, maybe you'd find it, a needle in a haystack. 
they actually found it. They found it. And the turtle, by the way, is Red Rockette was her name, so she was the winner. They actually found it. They went and got the tag off of it and sent the tag back with pictures of them smiling. The tag is like a treasure trove of data. And they actually found our turtle that we tagged in Nova Scotia, swam thousands of kilometers, and went to a beach, and these people went and found it. Like, amazing. How awesome is that? What a great story. We were so pleased at sort of the conclusion of this, of this race event, and people were really, uh, really interested in it. It also made a great connection showing how Canada is connected to other countries in order to conserve our wildlife. Is it really our wildlife, or is it a shared wildlife heritage that we need to look after? Lots of questions to look at, things that we're going to be dealing with as well. How else do you do conservation in the ocean? You need to share the knowledge and the conclusion. You need to build a relationship between the knowledge you generate and the people who are making that connection. And this is education. This is a form of understanding. And this is incredibly important too. We did this within the turtle race by trying to make curriculum guides for teachers so that they could use the knowledge and the observations that were coming out of the turtle network to build it into their curriculum for the for, for students to be able to discover the knowledge themselves, understand how that discovery takes place, and what the consequences of that knowledge are as well. Very important step. We did a wide variety of presentations. Presentations don't go so far. It's not often I get out to BC and have a chance to rant to people about how important turtles and wildlife are. So we did a lot of webinars with classrooms. How else am I going to convince and get to Saskatchewan and tell people in Saskatchewan that despite not having a coastline, they own leatherback turtles. And it's important that they know that. And the webinars were a big part of that and the presentations to, to make that connection and show the value of, of uh, having people understand and have the knowledge that these animals exist out there, the perils that they face, and the roles that they have in conserving them as well. Finally, how do you do conservation in the ocean? We need to improve the situation. Conservation doesn't occur until you act and there needs to be some action. And this is something that we're always pushing for. The example I'll give you here is with this risk analysis. So as I said, we uh, can model where right whales go. We can then model where the fishing goes. And we can identify areas, such as Graham and Ann Basin and Roseway Basin, where a lot of the risk occurs. From this knowledge, we can create recommendations for fisheries management <clears throat> that says, all right, if we manage fishing, fishing fishing, pardon me, in a variety of areas or exclude fishing in a variety of areas by a certain amount of time, we can quantify how much risk you are reducing it by. We can also quantify how many whales will not die as a result of the entanglement. If we aim for a 30% target, here's your menu. You choose what you want and add it up to 30% and we will see conservation taking place. DFO, uh, we provided this with our partners, again, WWF Canada and, and Dalhousie University. We provided this as a briefing note to Fisheries and Oceans Canada and said, here you go, here's the information. Let us know if we can work with you and, and see what we can do. So we're looking forward to the answer, to seeing what they're going to do. And if we have a chance, we're going to see improvement in conservation. Another example is, <clears throat> is a project that we've only uh, really started to get involved with, which is working with Canada's regional networks of marine animal emergency responders. Each Marine Region of Canada has a group of experts who are volunteers or parts of smaller organizations, I shouldn't say small, but smaller organizations, who respond to marine animals in distress, either marine animals being in places where they shouldn't be, or entangled in gear, or washed up dead on the shore. All of these are great opportunities for us to learn about these animals and possibly do conservation, which also leads to, to um, improving the situation for the animals too. We're looking to work with all of the groups in the areas, including the, the network that exists here in BC. We want to try and help augment and, and get the story out, uh, uh, improve uh, or help to improve their roles in their regions to make sure they continue to have the equipment and the training that they need to be able to respond and to bring their stories to the rest of the country so that people can see that there is a lot of action going on. There's a lot of conservation and response going on that people may not even be aware of. This project is really just uh, getting going now, but I wanted to mention it as another example of sort of action that's taking place to be able to try and see this conservation situation improve. So how do you do conservation in the ocean? Well, these are the, these are the elements. These are the things that work. You need to have the science. You need to have that knowledge. You need to have a support and willingness of people to see conservation take place. They need to have an understanding. That is the education that provides the relationship between that knowledge and the person who has this understanding. And then most importantly, you need to act. Something has to happen at the end of the day. 
you pull these things together, it's a slow process and it takes a long drive in some areas more than others, and you will see improvement. Things will be changing and you'll have conservation. I know exactly what you're thinking now. Great. Good job, good job for conservation. Good job, Canadian Wildlife Federation. Happy to hear it. I gotta go home now. See you later. Not so lucky. Do only scientists do conservation? I get asked this question, or I don't get asked this question, I get told this when I give presentations, especially to, to children, but not only children, but especially children, they'll come up to me and say, oh, I love whales, I want to become a marine biologist like you and help whales. <clears throat> and I think, that's good, but what if you don't become a marine biologist? Does that mean you're not going to help whales? Does that mean you're going to stop liking whales? Like, don't think you need to be a biologist to do conservation. Don't think you need to be a scientist to do conservation. <clears throat> you can be a chef, you can be a bus driver, you can be a beatnik artist, or you can be a superhero. It does not matter what you are in life, you can assist in conservation. You have a role in conservation, you are allowed to like animals and wildlife, it is not only the domain of biologists. You have the ability to make a difference and you are allowed to make a difference as well. Very important. <clears throat> as I put this slide together, it occurred to me that this kind of describes everything I wanted to be in my life, actually. <laughs> And I've only marginally accomplished the first one, but uh, maybe I'll get to a, get the rest of the way through sometime soon. <clears throat> so keep this in mind, and I want to make this point too. You know, this is the point that I'm making to you. You all have a role as well. You are allowed to like animals, even if you're a lawyer or a superhero or, or something that doesn't seem connected at all to wildlife. You are still allowed to appreciate and like wildlife. You still have a role in conservation. What is that role? This is my challenge. A, B, C, D. I tried to keep this as simple as possible so that you can remember it. You've got to remember your A, B, C, Ds. What is that? It is awareness of how you affect wildlife. It is the behavior that you have to change to improve the situation. You need to convince others to change as well or what the impact is. And finally, you need to demand better from those who control our, our, or manage our wildlife on your behalf or those who use the wildlife on your behalf. This is what you need to do. <clears throat> Pardon me. Let's take a quick look at each of these. Awareness, what do I mean by awareness? Well, you need to know how your life and how you live your life affects wildlife. Well, how are you gonna find that out? Well, you read, you look, you, you talk to people, you spend time looking for information. Everybody does it. Everybody looks for information and spends time reading. Attend talks for people who may know a little bit more, which you all are doing now, and I commend you for it. I appreciate it as well. You know, learn about how you may be having an impact on the world around you. You need to be aware. If you, are, if you do not understand how you live your life and the things you do in your life affects wildlife, then, and you turn, you're turning a blind eye to it, you're not trying to find out about it, then that's ignorance. And you don't want to be ignorant. You want to take responsibility for the way you learn your, uh, live your life. And you need to learn what that responsibility is. Once you learn it, then you need to change your behavior. What does that mean? Well, I don't know, let's use some examples. Deal with our waste. How do you dispose of your waste in your life? Do you pour oil down the drain? Are you still addicted to fossil fuels? Have you got rid of your car yet? Do you, we need to really end this fossil fuel addiction. Beyond turning out a light when we leave a room, you've got to, we've got to stop burning so many fossil fuels. <clears throat> Eliminate the frivolous use of plastics. I have a seven-year-old daughter, she loves balloons. And I'm like, oh, it's such a frivolous use of plastic. <clears throat> I'm not a fan of them, she likes them. This was a screensaver I found. I suppose it was intended to enlighten you when you turn your computer on every day and you see all these balloons floating away. This is a, like a horror scene to me. <laughs> these are all going right out over to the ocean and who, terrible things are gonna happen. These are, this, is, this is just ridiculous. So balloons, and I gotta tell you, the other one that I, that's bothering me lately, straws. Why do they always give me straws, right? Frivolous, plastics are important. We use plastics a lot in our life. They do a lot for health and safety and all kinds of other things, but there is a frivolous use of plastics and we need to prevent that. Be responsible users of natural resources is another way to change your behavior. <clears throat> Most of my coworkers don't like going to restaurants with me anymore because I believe one of the new social norms is if you order seafood in a restaurant, you have to ask where that seafood comes from. Do they know where it was bought? Do they know where it was caught? Do they know how it was caught? Is it, was it, you know, if I'm, in, if I'm in Mahone Bay in Nova Scotia, was it caught just off George's Bank or was it caught in a Russian trawl or in the Southern Ocean or something? This is important. You need to ask these things. It is embarrassing. 
That's why my coworkers don't eat dinner with me very much anymore. <clears throat> but you need to ask these things. If you, they don't have the answer, you shouldn't be buying it. That's very irresponsible. They need to have, and they need to learn that they have to have those answers. Because if we're going to eat wildlife, not farmed animals, but wildlife in restaurants, you need to take responsibility for this. I keep saying you. We, we all do need to take responsibility for this. Okay, third thing, convince others. You need to influence them. This involves talking to people and creating new social norms. I'm assuming you guys are better at it than me. I just tell people what they're doing wrong and tell them that they have to change. I don't have a lot of friends. But if you've got a lot of friends, you need to convince them and change their behavior. How do you do that? You do that by talking to them and making a difference, being an example for, for people. When they see you at a restaurant and you order a drink and say, please don't bring me that straw, they're going to be like, why, don't, why did you not ask for a straw? Well, it's a single-use plastic. It's going to go right into the garbage and outlive me. Why do I want it? And they're going to go, hmm, that's a good point. I never thought of that. Maybe they never thought of it. You need to be the source of awareness for other people and an inspiration for change. New social norms come about because we change the way we do things in society, and you need to be a part of this as well. Seat belts and cigarette smoking in public places are great examples of this, right? So take an active role in it. Finally, you need to demand better, which means dealing with your representatives in government. It is government who makes decisions on your behalf for wildlife because wildlife is essentially owned by everybody and they manage it for us. But they need to know what your opinion is on the way we live our lives and the way they manage it. And if they do not know your opinion, then they're not going to change things. We also need to talk, for that matter, to, to users, whether it's recreational fishermen or land use owners or um, uh, natural resource harvesters of any sort, right? They need to know. And what do I mean by this? Well, we'll go back to some of the examples we're talking about. Deal with our waste. Do you know, do you know if your sewage is treated in the town where you live? You should know. You need to be aware. If, you, if it is not treated, does your government, do your representatives know that you think it should be treated? Should, you know, I'm in Halifax. We now treat our sewage. We did not treat our sewage for the first two or three hundred years. We started treating our sewage two years ago. The only reason that happened is because our government representatives learned eventually that people wanted that to change, right? The frivolous use of plastics, I don't mean to keep dwelling on this, but the, the state of California recently banned plastic bags. Did you know that? That's amazing. How amazing is that? Do you think that's amazing? Do your does your government representatives know you think that's amazing? Because if they don't know, they're not going to do the same thing here. They have to know. You have to let these people know what you want and what you don't want. I mean, beyond, beyond voting and everything else, of course, you need to take part in that. You need to actually convey your interests and messages. Demand better for the people who look after your resources for you. And if they don't, decisions will be made without you. So you need to take an active role in that. OK, tonight, your three take-homes. I want to try and make this quick and short and, and, and not too painful. <clears throat> First of all, don't forget what wildlife are. No matter how strange or unusual, no matter how out of sight they are, do not let them be out of mind. No matter how insignificant they may seem, don't forget that they are a part of wildlife from individual animals and interactions of animals right up to locations and habitats. They have important consequences, and it's important to have this mindset. Two, how does CWF do conservation? I should be clear, this is how we go about doing conservation. There's several parts to doing, con pardon me, several parts to doing conservation. Science, connecting with Canadians, educating Canadians, and taking action. And I put my little star here because actually the conservation doesn't actually occur until you actually take some action and change something. But it can't just be the first parts. You need to, you need to educate, you need to create knowledge, you need to connect people, and then you need to make something change. Don't forget that. And finally, you know, despite these four things, we especially need you to accomplish conservation. I've given you these four challenges that everyone's now aware of that you're going to do. A, B, C, D, so easy to remember, right? Awareness, you're going to become more aware of your impacts, you're going to, behavior's going to change, you're going to convince others, and you're going to demand better. The other thing that's important as well, I feel compelled to mention is that you want to support organizations that are doing right, like the Vancouver Aquarium, like the Canadian Wildlife Federation. You can turn to these groups as for resources, particularly in your process to complete my challenge. But at the same time, it's all a part of what you do to help these things happen. We are looking after uh, an enormous heritage 
this is a part of who we are. Marine systems tend to be more ignored than, than others because nobody lives there. At least you can go for a walk in the woods and run into a moose, but you're not going to go for a walk in the woods and run into a right whale or a leatherback turtle. And it makes a big difference to be able to have that mindset and know that there is, it is important that we are doing the right thing and you are living your, your life in a way that is not having a major impact on it. That is all I had to say to you for tonight. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate the opportunity. If you're looking for more information, you can go to our website, the Canadian Wildlife Federation.ca. My email is here if you have any questions. And I think if we have time, I will answer some questions as well. Thank you very much. OK, so does anyone have a question they would like to ask? OK, I got a hand right here. Um, at the beginning, you had um, some uh, different slides on some of the programs that you offer and the different activities. Are those offered all throughout Canada? Like, is there some things that we could go and see in Vancouver of that? Uh, so you mean through Canadian Wildlife Federation, so the Walk for Wildlife and, and um, the Love Your Lake program, these are the different programs? Uh, many of our programs are national in scale, so for sure we run, for example, the Rivers to Oceans Week. We try and promote activities that are promoting Oceans Week each year. The National Wildlife Campaign goes throughout the country. We want people to go out and, and do a walk for wildlife and register that walk. The Great Canadian Camp Out happens every summer where we encourage people to go out and go camping on a particular weekend and so on. Some of these are not so much location-based but rather activities for the entire nation that we're encouraging people to do. Some of them are location-based, um, uh, but there are none that I can think of right now that we have on the go. We do another program of ours that I'll just talk about quickly is the Endangered Species Program, and we have an Endangered Species Fund, and we fund a tremendous amount of research in Canada on uh, species at risk. And one of, we have several projects that are here in Vancouver, and we're, we have a project that going on here at the Vancouver Aquarium right now um, I meant to mention earlier, which is a part of this disentanglement work that they're doing for sea lions. It's amazing work that they're doing here, and we're, we're happy to support that sort of work, too. So always open to options, though, is also the short answer. Thank you. OK, we've got another question over here, and then we'll um, answer some questions on the internet. I heard that um, in Florida, people were um, putting in the water their fish from their own personal aquariums. Has that happened in Canada as well? I, I'm certain it happens in Canada. <clears throat> I don't know. So I think that um, one of the situations, if it's, if it's what you're referring to, is the lionfish invasion that's taking place in Florida. So people had these beautiful lionfish that aren't native to the area, and then they get tired of having them, so they dump them into the water. And it turns out, uh, you know, Florida is as suitable for lionfish as it is for Canadians, and they, and they thrived down there and uh, started expanding. And, of course, these are very predatory fish, so they started having lots of problems and so on. Um, has this happened in Canada? Uh, I'd say yes. Uh, certainly in freshwater systems, we've seen a lot of cases where people have been dumping out bait that they, they take minnows from one lake and they go fishing somewhere else and they finish fishing and they dump the minnows into the water and the minnows will, will expand to different lakes. I don't know of an example that's happened so clearly with the marine system yet, uh, but it almost certainly can happen. It happens with other animals as well. I understand here in Stanley Park you had a, a mild infestation of elegant red-eared slider turtles that people were releasing into the lake and they were surviving through the year as well. And this is another example of people who are, you know, perhaps I don't want to say being irresponsible, perhaps being a little bit thoughtless about how they treat wildlife. So the, to answer your question succinctly, it hasn't happened. It, it happens in Canada, but we've not had the, any sort of invasion yet. But all the more reason we want to avoid it, really. No worries. OK, I'm going to ask one question from our internet audience here. Sure. Um, there's a couple questions come through. I'm just going to kind of paraphrase them and put them into one. So what are your thoughts on the? Um, the uh, nuclear reactors uh, from uh, uh, Fukushima, Fukushima that have been um, releasing radioactivity into the ocean, to the Pacific, for the last few years. My thoughts on it? Hmm. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, 
Specifically, um, one of them wants to know if there's possibly any impact to killer whales um, and uh, reproductive success here mm -hmm. um, or their vocalizations like singing, um, but then also just in general. Well, um, you know, Fukushima was a terrible accident, first of all, uh, and, it, and it was an accident, so we need to keep that in mind, and, and accidents and bad things are going to happen. The, uh, you know, with respect to the radiation that's out there, I've seen several reports that have measured the amounts. They, the, the, the scientific reports that I've seen suggest they are below uh, levels that can affect, for example, there were people who were speculating that this sea star wasting disease might have been a consequence of Fukushima and such, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, the, the jury is still out. Most of the science that I'm seeing is suggesting that it isn't as big of impact as many of the other impacts we're having. So, for example, re um, referencing your, your note to the killer whales, I think the, the threats and the impacts that killer whales are facing locally are much larger than anything that is a threat to them from radiation from Fukushima, particularly based on the science that's being done and the amount of radiation. So it's there. It's definitely a consequence of what we have on this world. It's definitely the type of thing we want to avoid. And it is one of those thousand cuts that may lead to deaths that we want. But it is not the, the I don't believe it's the killing stroke, but it's certainly adding to it. So that, that's what I have to say about that. All right. Thanks for answering that. Uh, any other questions uh, from our uh, audience tonight? We don't have any other online questions right now. So anyone else here at the aquarium? Yep. Thanks, John. Thanks so much for the talk. Um, one of the really neat things about working at the aquarium is that we get to listen to so many neat stories about people taking conservation action. But another side to that is that we often find that we're sometimes repeating the same messages. And of course, repetition can be great. But maybe you can share a story of something that's been innovative in terms of conservation or something that kind of reinvigorated uh, your love for, for conservation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, just about everything that we end up touching on, so many of these projects that we work on often end up surprising me. Sometimes it is a danger. It's not so much that, that we're repeating it, as those of us who are involved in conservation and delivering these messages, you know, even some of the messages that I talked to you tonight, I was thinking of this, you think, oh man, I've said this so many times, do I need to say this again? But often when you're saying this, you're saying it for the first time for somebody and they're hearing it for the first time. It's amazing to see the reaction that people have and the seriousness that, that people will take some of the questions or challenges or demands that you make of them when, you're, when, when we run these programs. The Love Your Lake program, you know, this is this program where we go in and do an assessment of cottage owners' shorefront property and give recommendations about how they could be doing things better or different so that they're having less of an impact on their lake. People are taking to this, you know, they're so enthusiastic about it. It's so surprising and encouraging to see that people want that. You know, often it's just this vacuum of understanding, a vacuum of knowledge. It's not any sort of malicious nature, but it's a vacuum. The other one that I'll mention is, uh, is a, a conservation project a couple of years ago that uh, took place on the East Coast where the right whales, for example, in the Bay of Fundy, were in the middle of a, uh, uh, an important traffic lane for large vessels coming through. And a couple of organizations, CWF wasn't involved at the time, but a couple of other organizations sort of looked at this and said, oh, this is a, a tough situation. We've got to do something about this. And finally, they went and talked to the industry, and they talked to Transport Canada. <clears throat> and they just said, oh, is that a problem? Well, we can move them. So they eventually just moved the shipping lanes. The reason I tell this story is because what's so amazing is that they were having an impact that they didn't realize they were having. All you had to do was draw attention to the fact that there was an impact, and people are often willing to change and willing to do what's right in order to reduce that impact. It's simply that absence of knowledge at the beginning that they even realize that there's a problem in the first place. And I've seen that time and time again, even in the work that, that we've been doing at, at CWF. Sometimes it's all it takes is a little, it's a little bit of understanding to say, you know, people who work in a nuclear power plant aren't trying to destroy fish and if they are, if they are, if it's brought to their attention, maybe something can be done to solve it. And it's amazing how many seemingly large problems can be solved with pretty simple, straightforward solutions. So that's, that's one of the biggest eye-openers for me, and it, and it always sort of sets things in perspective for me. When we set out to start 
addressing a conservation issue is start simple and you'll be surprised how much you can accomplish. It's really, it's really good that way. And thus, I want to start with you guys because there is a lot of seemingly simple things that you can do. Not having balloons at your birthday, you may, that could be just a, a, a start of a big difference. You can't clap your hands and walk away from it. That's a start of a big difference and, and you'll be surprised what can, you can accomplish there. All right, I'm with you on the balloons, yeah. actually. <laughs> uh, okay, a couple of other questions come in through social media. So first one from Twitter, uh, how, can, how can you get back to viewing wildlife as a species first? So uh, I, I, I'm wondering if they're asking, you know, how, can, how do we see them as more of kind of, um, you know, through a more <clears throat> altruistic or holistic kind of, you know, how do we view them as actual animals instead of like all these other things, right? Utilitarian yep. view, yeah. Yeah, that, um, that's a good question, and it's it's one of the things that we often do forget about is that sometimes they're their problems, sometimes they're food, sometimes they're money, and I, it takes a bit of a shift in your mind to understand this. And CWF has this. This is a perspective of CWF: is that our intention is to make sure that there is wildlife there for the use and enjoyment of all. And what is the use? Is we don't define an enjoyment. We don't define either, but. You know, <clears throat> our goal is to make sure that there's wildlife there. I think that, um, I think that sometimes all it takes is that, that mindset. <clears throat> Pardon me, here's a, here's a great example of how it's important, is learning to see an animal as an animal as opposed to food, okay? This happened with whales. We used to hunt whales, mostly for their oil, sometimes for their baleen, for our clothes and our, our uh, um, we didn't have plastics back then, so we used their baleen for this as well. And we hunted them like crazy. They were just out there. They were resources that we needed, and we hunted them down. Then all of a sudden, the moratorium came in. The IWC said, we're decimating whales. We're going to stop this whaling, right? Incidentally, Canada is not a signatory on the IWC, but we stopped whaling before the IWC did. Very impressive, actually. So um, we stopped whaling, and we haven't whaled for many years now. The idea of whaling, can you imagine if whaling started again? <clears throat> There's lots of whales out there. To, to, to be fair, we probably could hunt some whales sustainably. Some of them seem to be in, in good populations. That's a bit debatable. I'm not sure humans can sustainably hunt anything, but um, theoretically it could happen. But it wouldn't work because I don't think it, very many people would want to eat them. And it's because whales went from being a resource to being whales and they had a higher status. The other piece of evidence that I can give you that this is a true situation is with bluefin tuna. So bluefin tuna are being decimated right now, you may know. Um, there's a lot of debate about how they're being managed internationally. They are managed internationally and there's a lot of debate about how that's being done. You know, we start to see a slight increase in the, in the population. All of a sudden everybody wants a higher quota so that we can catch more. Great, tuna are coming back. No, tuna are down here. 30 years ago they were up here, we still have a long ways to go. No, no good. <clears throat> so tuna's in a bad situation, let me just tell you. So they go to these, at these um, tuna markets, particularly in Japan where there's a, lo a lot of fishery in the tuna. You get conservation reporters over there talking about the tuna and the plight of the tuna and all these giant tunas that are coming in that we may be losing and how, what amazing animals they are. But then what's interesting is a lot of the time, and, and I, you know, I, I glean this from talking to these uh, and reading some of these reporters, you know, when there's an opportunity to taste it, do you want to taste this, this, this giant tuna? Oh, this is terrible. You know, should we be taking all these out of the ocean? Do you want to taste this? Yeah, I want to taste that, right? So they'll want to taste it because they've got to taste it before it's gone. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? Like, they, these people who are concerned with the conservation of this animal aren't even recognizing it as an animal that we're losing. They're recognizing it as a food we're losing. And gosh, I better get a taste before it's gone. So making that mind shift from an animal as a resource or a food or whatever it is to an animal in its own right is enormous and very important. <clears throat> it has to be done. I think the question is how do you do that? That's a big challenge. For me, I'm talking to as many people as I can. Um, for you, I think it's more about learning this, becoming aware of it, and convincing others to have that perspective as well. But it's not easy, and it is most certainly something that, that we have to do to, to be able to address it, because more and more there's evidence that that's actually the case. Once people make that connection and recognize an animal as a wildlife species, they want to protect it and conserve it. 
<clears throat> it's, there's other situations where they will still um, use it. For example, in the recreational sport fishery, salmon has a bit of a reputation this way, right? You see lots of people who catch salmon, either West Coast or even Atlantic, the few Atlantic salmon that are left, and they catch these beautiful fish, and everybody likes to do the same thing. They pose with it and make a weird face, right? And that's what they like to do because they love this animal so much. They take photos of themselves looking really strange, posing with them. They may even eat it, but first of all, they appreciate it. The same is true of, of many um, recreational hunters who hunt bighorn sheep or anything else. They love these animals. They, they put them on their walls, and many people are like, that's disgusting. You know, isn't, that, isn't that terrible? But what it is is it's an admiration for the animal. Right? Sometimes maybe it's a trophy hunting, and you've got to be aware of that and be cautious of it. But you need to first recognize it as an animal, and then second, recognize it as a resource. How you go about doing that? Well, I, I hope that I've shown you how CWF goes about doing it, and I'm sure there's other ways to do it too, but we each need to find our way because it makes a big difference. Yeah, great. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, whales because I think that's a great example of over a number of decades, public opinion about whales changed, right? And that's why yeah. we now think of whales as whales and a part of the ecosystem and being important, and not just as food. Um, and organizations like CWF, the Vancouver Aquarium, we're all out there raising awareness, and that was, I think, one of your first points, was to raise awareness. Uh, one last question from the internet, and then if there's anyone in the audience, we can take one last question in our audience here as well. Um, this one came through our YouTube channel. Uh, why do you think the bull kelp uh, doesn't seem to take well anymore at the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California? And I'm not sure how the bull kelp in the Monterey Bay Aquarium is doing. They're not getting along. So um, I think, yeah, just kind of take that, you know, as well, a fact and then... Uh, if, you're ref if you're referring to why the bull kelp is not growing in the aquarium well anymore, I'm not totally sure that that's the situation. Um, <clears throat> the short answer is I don't know. But what I do know is that seaweeds, as we call them, are very complex organisms. They are not as... They are considered simple in the evolutionary world of things. They're considered simple cellular things, but they're not that simple. Many seaweeds have complex life cycles, more complex than we can even imagine. Um, you know, they don't just have like males and females. They don't just have sort of uh, a, a, a gametic form and a, and a, and a non-sex form. They have a third form as well. So these are, these are actually very complicated and very sophisticated organisms that have been around for a very long time. Having said all that, they are really cool, that's what I'm trying to say. Having said all that, they can be affected by all kinds of things. I think that particularly when you're dealing with, particularly when you're dealing with animals in captivity, I'm sure Vancouver Aquarium deals with this a lot, there are a lot of fine-tuning details, there are a lot of issues that may affect an animal or a plant that you may be completely unaware of and it will require some adjustment, fine adjustments to be able to find that sweet spot where it works. So that could be the case. Also, and I'm, I'm simply purely speculating here. Also, because we're dealing with biological organisms, there are, there are diseases that we don't even understand that can affect biological organisms and wipe them out. So if they're having difficult maintaining, you know, it could be a matter of their husbandry practices. It could be a matter that a, a disease gets into the system. The white-nose syndrome that's affecting bats, we, we, for some reason, didn't expect it here in North America. It seems like a human brought it over and now it's just wiping out bats. We didn't expect this to happen. And, and there's all kinds of things that can go on. Biology and understanding animals is really hard. You know, my, the, uh, the, my supervisor in, in, for my research used to say, you know, this is biology. This is ecology. You know, this isn't rocket science. This is harder than rocket science. Rocket science has constants and, and, and stable numbers and things that laws that define how it goes. Biology and ecology isn't defined this way. There is much more going on than we, than we can even understand, and we're only starting to get a grasp of it. So sorry for the long answer. That's great. Any other uh, final questions here at the Vancouver Aquarium? We got one. OK, we'll take this one, and then our speaker will be available to answer your questions yeah, sure. um, after our, our webcast tonight. Um, many other conservation organizations have citizen science projects where they're using like apps and things like that to generate actual research and data? Does CWF have anything like that? We do not yet, but we actually have stuff in the works right now. A real challenge, um, a real challenge for these citizen science programs is, is to make sure that the data 
has a good purpose for being collected. A good purpose can be to, to, to make a connection between people and wildlife, and, and that's a really great thing. But we really also want to make sure that we have a good question and a good reason to be collecting that data that will lead to action eventually, that I was saying as well. So, um, so we're spending a fair amount of time thinking about this and talking about it. We are looking at, at uh, a program right now. It's, uh, I think it's going to move ahead, but it's in the very early stages. We're looking at uh, developing a BioBlitz program and, and a program related to uh, an iNaturalist, for example, or, or these apps that you use on your phone to help collect this information. So the answer is not yet, but stay tuned, please. All right, great. And I want to just take a couple of minutes. First of all, I would like to thank you very much, Sean, for coming out tonight. Oh, that was an pleasure. excellent presentation, and CWF is doing some really great work. So thank you very much for coming tonight. You're welcome. Thank you. And listen, thank you. It's a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here at the Vancouver Aquarium and get a chance to come and talk to, to your patrons here and, and to, to see the facility and, and to, to do this type of work together. So real, real thrill. This uh, is a great opportunity. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. I want to also take a couple of minutes to uh, talk about a few of our programs. I think there were some connections made during your presentation tonight. So uh, our BC Cetacean Sightings Network uh, does work here uh, in British Columbia where citizen scientists that are out on the water can go in and log in information, sightings that they have. I believe we do have an app for that uh, that people can sign in or they can call in. Oh, it's coming soon. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, so folks can be a part of citizen science and helping us identify the, the cetaceans and, uh, and leatherback turtles if they see them out here. Uh, we also have the Oceanwide Sustainable Seafood Program. So that's a great program because when you go out to the restaurant, you just look at the menu and if you see the Ocean Y symbol there, you know it's good, it's sustainable, you can eat it. You don't need to ask them any questions. Uh, so it makes it really easy to use. But you can. Pardon me? You can say, why doesn't this have Ocean Y? You, you absolutely can ask good. some questions. Why right. isn't this Ocean Y? That would be a great question to it ask. It may them. not make you popular with your date, <laughs> but you'll be doing the right thing. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, we have the boat show that's going on right now at, uh, in Vancouver, the, the International Boat Show, and the Aquavan is there. Yep. So uh, folks can go down and check that program out and check out the boat show, and CWF has a booth out there with the aquarium. So we hope to see you out there. Yep. That's going on until Saturday, Sunday. Sunday. Yeah, Sunday. So Sunday. from now until Sunday, we have the boat show going on. And then uh, here at the Vancouver Aquarium, we have some upcoming public programs. Uh, on February 4th, we have uh, Dr. Paul Noctegal, who's going to be talking about echolocation and cetaceans. On February 10th, we have Dr. Anna Hall returning uh, to talk about the vanishing vaquita. Are we eyewitnesses to an extinction? Um, and then on February 24th, we're going to start gearing up for our uh, Sea Monsters Revealed promotion with some programming around sea monsters and other kinds of monsters in the sea. So we hope you can join us. Thank you very much for coming here tonight. Thank you very much, and have a good night. Yeah.